I want to acknowledge that because every single person in here is walking in with a heavy heart and so many things on our minds. And I, I just want to say, first of all, thank you for showing up. It's hard. Sometimes it's just hard to, to know what to do next. But the fact that you came here, you decided to open your, your, your lives up a little bit to just listen and, and let joy fill your heart um, is so, so important. Um, you know, I, I'm a mom first before anything. And watching uh, the Jewish lives that have been lost, the Palestinian lives that have been lost, um, it's just devastating. And I, I don't profess to be any sort of expert on war or conflict or the Middle East, so I am not gonna speak about that. But I do want you to know that for my team and myself, our hearts are broken and, and we just wanna close our eyes and just send love and light to everyone who is suffering right now in the world. If you guys can join me. Um, I just want to send all of this positive light and energy towards the people who need it most. So that said, I, um, I want to say something too. Also, as we walk through today, we have no idea what the person next to us has been dealing with. So I really hope, my biggest hope here is that everyone brings their deepest compassion and their openest heart to every conversation and every interaction. And let's just, let's take care of each other today. Okay. Amazing. All right, so today is going to be an amazing day. We're going to share some incredible stories with some of my favorite storytellers. And I really think this is important. You got to make new friends. I'm going to be the mom in the room for a second. You got to make new friends. You got to say hi first. Okay, even if you're nervous, just say hi first. Put your hand out. And you're going to learn about some of the women at Hell Sunshine that inspire us the most. Um, and I really hope this fills your tanks. With, with the joy, the happiness, the optimism that you need to go back out into the world with more advice and more wisdom and more inspiration. So, without further delay, are you ready for the most incredible day? Okay. We are going to shine away. So when I say shine, I want you to say away. So I'm gonna say shine. She is a strategic force. She's an award-winning leader and a mother of two daughters. She has earned global recognition for exceptional ability to build, inspire, and scale. Please welcome Kellen. I'm gonna say hi. I just changed the order on her and she's like, what's happening? Okay. But I just had to say, I want to say I'm thrilled to welcome our, my dear friends to this stage. You know, when I talk about people you gotta call, you gotta call your community. I called these two women and I said, I'm doing this thing and I'm really nervous and they were like, yes. And the other one was like, I got something else, hold on, let me cancel it. So, these two women who are coming to stage tonight, right now are two of my dearest friends and they, I wanna to talk to them about the impact they have as women, the connectivity in their lives. Please welcome to the stage, Jennifer Garner and Mindy Kaling. of introducing two women who need no introduction. But here I go. All right, Jennifer Garner. She is an award-winning actress. Philanthropist and entrepreneur. She is a longtime member of Save the Children. She's a board of trustees member and She's the co-founder of organic kid food company, Once Upon a Farm. Okay, Mindy Kaling. A 
Emmy-nominated writer. Tony-winning producer. New York Times best-selling author. And, of course, world-renowned actor. In addition to all of that, she's also a National Medal of Arts recipient who started her Hollywood career on The Office. And to create anthemic series like The Mindy Project, <laughs> Never Have I Ever, and The, and the Sex Lives of College Girls. I knew that one would get a roar. Okay, so, since we're the first panel of the day, I think we gotta get the party started. Are you ladies down for a quick, rapid fire set of questions? Let's do it. Okay. What now, a way to get canceled, first thing in the morning. <laughs> to say something quickly. Yeah, whatever comes top of mind first, and try and be as truthful as honest, uh, truthful as possible without getting canceled, I guess. All right, I'm gonna start with Reese. Here are your seven questions, Reese. Seven. Lucky number seven. Only, okay. only 21 questions to have to say. We'll do 21 for a minute. Yes, yes. Okay. okay. Reese. Yes. What nickname did you have growing up? Um, Ladybug. Mm, that was my name. First job? <laughs> Babysitting. Last Halloween costume? Oh. Uh, last Halloween I was um, Tippi Hedren. Yeah, from the birds, yeah. <laughs> Which is kind of the outfit I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, this was my Halloween costume <laughs> last year. Go-to karaoke song? Uh, Hound Dog by Elvis Presley. Ooh. Strong choice, right? Thanks. Portia. Super strong. There were like five claps. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Favorite ice cream flavor? What? Favorite ice cream flavor? Oh, uh, coffee. Coffee. Oh, yeah, if you were the winning contestant in a game show, what game show would that be? Which game show wouldn't it be? No, um, <laughs> Wheel of Fortune, because I'm a wheel watcher. Anybody else a wheel watcher? Yes. yes. What do you do to relax? Uh, what's that? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Ditto. <laughs> you do, I know what you do. You do paint by numbers. Oh, yes. Because you right. gave it to me for Christmas. Oh, you're right. And now I have my little paint by numbers of flowers. That's right, okay, yeah. yeah. I do paint. Yeah. Thanks, yeah, I'm helping yeah. out. Thank you, yeah. Maybe we should answer each other's questions. Because I could, we probably do that for Jen and Mindy. Yeah, pay by numbers. Yeah. Okay, perfect transition. Jen, you're up. You're up. What is your favorite candy? Wait, I don't get to do the one she did? Because <laughs> I have it all worked out in my head. My nickname was Puppy. I poured church at coffee for $2, or coffee at church for $2 an hour. Church at coffee. Okay, go ahead. Do you guys want to know what her favorite candy is? Yeah. Yes. Um, the C's candy that have marshmallows and caramel. First concert you ever attended? Um, gosh, I really haven't been to that many. The first concert I ever t attended was, um, oh my gosh, I can see her in my mind. She's a favorite. You know who I'm talking about. I'll get back to you on that. I can't do it. Not Madonna. Nobody like Madonna came through Charleston, West Virginia. I mean, we all went to see Willie Nelson because he would come through. So Willie Nelson. Perfect. Strong. Night owl or morning person? Both, but morning person. How many books have you read this year? Oh my gosh, so many. I want to talk to you guys about so many books. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> awesome answer. Must Talk have wine, or are <laughs> you just going to leave us hanging like that? Um, have you read um, Demon Copperhead yet? No. It's so depressing. It's so beautiful. <laughs> it's so great and hard. And it tells the story of what's happening in rural America, and it kills me. It's beautiful. Hard. Barbara King Silver, right? Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. Okay. Must have ingredient to cook with. Lemon, if I'm cooking. Uh, vanilla if I'm baking. Ooh, good call. Who's your best friend? My bestie? Your bestie? Um, I, I have a lot of besties from different points of life, but I would say 
overarching, I'd have to give that up to N. King Salaka. Who do you call for work advice? Uh, right there. Same person. Same person. <laughs> Who is your favorite actress? I mean, come on! <laughs> come on! You can't get better. These were the questions I was given. Okay, Mindy, yes. now you're in the hot seat. Yes, yes, okay, here I am. What is your favorite color? Yellow. What is the last book you read? The Paris Apartment, but honestly, whatever Reese Witherspoon tells me to read. <laughs> when Reese opens that book, I'm reading that book. Good call. What song puts you in a happy mood? What song puts me in a happy mood? Uh, I'm a big Swifty. I love I love that song, Delicate. That's mm. good. What never fails to make you laugh? Okay, uh, on The Office, Michael Scott played this character called Prison Mike, this one episode, where he was like this very probably offensive guy who went to prison. He was like a tough guy. Um, so Steve Carell playing Prison Mike on The Office. <laughs> who do you call for mom advice? Reese Witherspoon. We all call Reese Witherspoon. <laughs> who do you text the most? I text Reese kind of a lot. But by the way, it's not always advice. Sometimes I'm just like ranting. And I'm like, can you believe this? I was treated this way. And she's a good person to, to rant to. And who is your favorite person in the whole world besides your children? Um, gotta say, Reese Witherspoon. Okay, this is just, she's got it all, you guys. Today's her day. She's got it all. Amazing, okay. What an awesome way to start things off. Clearly, Reese, the next question is headed your way. Okay. You are, you are just a fountain of advice and support for these women. All right. So you tell stories across so many different mediums. What do you look for in a good story? And how has that evolved over the course of your career? Um, well, I started, like, when I was a really little girl, I read and read and read. So I was always very bookwormy. And I think um, I always looked for just honestly strong female characters that had a unique point of view. I was always looking for something that felt different. I'd read so much stuff that felt the same, so I think that sort of translated into my early career when I started picking characters. I was like, I want something that sort of, um, I would get, I would read these parts and I'd be like, yeah, but I'm gonna make a weird choice. And and if the director like likes me in auditions because I made that weird choice, then I think that's probably what started my early career. It's just kind of things that I felt like would be a little bit off or a little heightened. So I got I got started playing characters that were, and I can't talk about any of them because we're at a sack strike right now, but um, that's how I started my career. So I think a lot of that translates to how we choose books, um, which is really interesting women who are the heroes of their own story. Because I, it was true then, but it's even more true as I get older, I realize more and more that women save themselves every day. Like no one's coming to save you, <laughs> you know? And so many early stories you're told as a young girl, it's like, oh, well, someone's gonna come save you, or a guy's gonna save you, or a magical situation is gonna be fixing this, but it's not. And when you grow up, you wanna read things that reinforce this idea that everything you have is inside of you, and it's all there, so you just have to trust yourself. So that's the center of most of our stories. Okay, Jen. You're also somebody who started your career as an actress, but you blossomed into so, so much more. Do you think that your experiences telling stories in TV and film have helped shape your entrepreneurial path? And if I can squeeze in a two-parter, what is the story behind Once Upon a Farm? Well, I would say, I would back it up and say that, yes, I've always loved telling stories. When I was in elementary school, my talent at the talent show was telling a long form tall tale. And it was called Soap. And I still remember just having the, the elementary school in the palm of my hand, Oakwood Elementary. And it was so, so much fun. And I, I still feel that way. I love so much just stories beginning, middle, end, the messiness of it, the not knowing where it's going. I, I'm so thrilled to have that be part of my job. But I realized early on that 
part of my storytelling could help women tell stories who weren't able to tell their own. And that's really where my work with Save the Children came in, is that I'm lucky enough to go, I work in rural America, although Save is global, obviously, but I'm lucky enough to get to go into homes all across the country and into, you know, homes that carry, could carry shame because they might be trailers without, um, without a window or with the oven open for heat. But I get to go in there and bear witness to what moms and, and parents and caregivers are going through in order to raise their kids in less than optimal circumstances. And then I get to tell those stories. And that has been um, just a, kind of the biggest gift in my life. And I think that all the work that I've done up until starting working with Save 15 years ago really helped push me forward in that way. And then that's also part of how Once Upon a Farm came to be, because we started realizing that in fundraising for, for Save the Children, we were going more and more to um, big organizations and to big companies, and that business was pushing philanthropy in a way more than foundations were. So we, we Mark Shriver, who's been my boss at Save Forever, said to me, you know, if you really want to change philanthropy, if you want to help save the children, go start a business and build save into it from the beginning. And that was part of it, that Nicole and I started looking for a business that I could be part of on the ground floor and in, you know, insert save into the mission. So that, um, and then of course, I was lucky enough to meet Cassandra Curtis who had started Once Upon a Farm and I loved her food. And then um, we, John Foraker, who had run the Andes, he and I came together, joined them and joined her and then we've been off to the races. Congratulations. Thank you. Can I just say, I have a, a three-year-old and a five-year-old. Once Upon a Farm is such a staple in our house. It is so delicious. Yes, I eat my children's food in their pouches sometimes. But it's like, I'm a busy single mom. I'm also lazy. So having easy access to super healthy food and then knowing that you really care. Like, she's like on the farm. I don't know if you follow her on Instagram. She's on the farm. She's making sure there's like... So I'm like, oh great, I don't have to do it because I know Jen Parker is. It's oh really gosh, amazing. This is the yeah. nicest thing anyone can no, say to me. It's made, it, it's made with so much care and love. Thank you, you can tell. I just like, I just, Thank you. I love that you have that side of you. I would, like, I would never do that, that hot. So impressed when people do stuff that I'm like, oh God, that's like so incredible. So I, I'm an appreciative because it's such a great product. So thank you and congrats. Since Mindy's got the mic, let's, let's, here's a question for you. You have such a distinct voice and an incredible sense of humor. It's universal in all of your work. Can you talk about the story behind Why Not Me and why it was important for you to write that book? Yes, absolutely, thank you. Um, honestly, it came out of real impatience because I was on the office for eight years and they have, you know, I know because of, I keep messing this up but because of the because of our our strike that we're on right now we're not supposed to be mentioning a lot of projects which side note is why I'm not mentioning a project that they did together that was so amazing and such um, it was the mystery that they worked on and I watched every episode and was on her Instagram and her Instagram and what happens next but normally we'd be talking about that so um, one of the things that's amazing about writing books is that when I was on that show, I loved it, but I had a very small part. And I'm an ambitious person and an impatient person, and I wanted to be able to have my voice out there. And Twitter wasn't enough. And I felt like I had these stories um, that I wanted to tell. Some of them were funny. Some of them made me angry. Some of them were sad, like about my mother dying, and I wanted to be able to tell those in my voice at my own pace, not in 140 characters. And um, that's why I did that, honestly. It was just because I felt like I had a lot to say. And patience can be a huge motivator. I patience love that is point. my primary motivator. <laughs> and money, my need for money. <laughs> and patience and money, you heard it here first. <laughs> okay, Reese, you've championed so many stories throughout your career. You have been the rocket fuel when it comes to changing the narrative for women. Can you talk about how bringing stories to life that are representative of the storyteller, how they're so important to you, and maybe speak to the importance of it? Right, well, um, 
when Hell Sunshine started, I think it was really important to me. I touched on it a little bit at the beginning, but um, the power of female partnership was really uh, the rocket fuel that started the company. Um, so for so many years, I had worked in a business where there was usually like one woman in a room or two, but they were in different departments, and there was no feeling of promoting each other or collaborating because there just wasn't. It wasn't a. It wasn't a competitive environment. It was just literally a scarcity environment. So I thought instead of trying to build something inside a system that wasn't built for female partnership, I got to build it outside. So that's why um, when I partnered with Sarah Hardin and we started raising capital and going into the world, like we started thinking, how do you build something totally different outside a system that doesn't work for women and female storytellers? Um, and so that just, that female partnership that started with Sarah and I then started with um, building each part of our company in a way that um, leaned into the fact that we had worked with all these amazing women. I was actually friends. Like when I sit here and look at Mindy and Chad, like we were personal friends before we ever worked together. I called Mindy, I, think, I met her at something and then I called her after I read Why Not Me and I was like, I, I have to, we have to sit down. You're amazing. You have the voice that I just, I want to work with you. I want to write with you. I want to do comedy with you. And um, and Jen and I, I, I think we connected over a charity where we were working on children's charity and scholarships. Um, so we were always like-minded about comedy or about um, philanthropy. And these two women are two of the first people that I called when I did Hell and Sunshine. I was like, will you work with me? How can we work together? I had pitched many 17 podcasts that we still never did. But I was like, what about, what about this one where we just watch a rom-com and drink wine? Is that a, is that a podcast or is that like a Friday I mean, night? Yes, yes. <laughs> I was like, or do we just want to hang out? Or do we like hang out and record it? What are we going to do? <laughs> and of course I called Jen every time. I'm like, read a great book. And I'm like, do you want to star in this? Do you like, do you want to do that? Okay, but Jen, I'm like, I want to be protective of your time with your kids because you know, you're going through a lot right now, and this is a lot. So is this a good one or not? So it was just about the excitement of being able to work with my very dearest friends, too. And I'm very, very lucky and fortunate that being in this business, I've been able to build these kind of friendships, you know, but with women who are equally supportive and encouraging and lift me up. Can we talk for a second about who Reese is to women in this community? Do you mind if I just, do you mind if I digress? Because I think back to, first of all, I think back to being pregnant. I think, you know, this one was sitting next to me. I think back to going through a very public, very hard moment in my life. This one was right there. And I, the, the way I needed to get through it was <laughs> dance cardio. And I danced cardio so hard we broke her foot, but she kept going. <laughs> Okay, that, that just, just keep dancing, ladies. Yeah. Just, <laughs> just keep just like, dancing. It was like, okay, we worked out at seven on vacation. We're gonna work out again at two. She was like, uh huh, I'm gonna be there. I'm gonna be there. Drinking water, resting. Well, and to what Jen is saying, I was on set on a movie with Reese, and we were in New Zealand, and I was like, oh man, you know, in my mid thirties, I haven't met that person. I just did this disastrous relationship and this and. I don't know, maybe I should do it on my own. And Reese just like looked me dead in the eye. We were like in this remote part of New Zealand and we're just like, do it. And I did, I did it twice. And it, that's a scary thing to embark on. And sometimes you need that person. I mean, I think we see Reese as an entertainer. She's obviously so funny and so talented. But as a friend, the person who can tell you tough things, um, and, and you believe her, you know, because you've, you've been through so much and you're incredibly open about it. Um, and so, yeah, I, I just, it's, it's. But she'll also look at you and say, okay, you need to be finding a preschool. This kid is like two and a half and they need to start next month. You actually have to get on this. It's not just, they're not gonna knock on your door. You actually have to, this is LA. You have to go find your preschool. But I just want to say that when, so I don't know what we're allowed to talk about, what we're not allowed to talk about. I'm gonna be oblique. When women got together, actresses, and talked about things in our industry together, you and me, too. 
Um, <laughs> those meetings happened at Reese's house. And it was the first time I'd ever sat down with that many actresses in the same room that we weren't like passing each other in an award show in big dresses where we just sat, we've been siloed off. The one place that doesn't happen, when the place that started the change, where that no longer can happen, is Hello Sunshine. Thank you. And it's just true. Yeah. It's just true. Thank you. Both of you. That is incredible. Okay. You're all mothers. How has motherhood impacted the stories you want to tell, the stories you want to bring to the world? I mean, I remember growing up and the stories were so cool. I remember like Sigourney Weaver and Holly Hunter and just like incredible women in movies. And oh, oh, and I remember, like I always send many clips from this show where there's four Southern women at a design firm. I can't say what it is, but you know what it is. And she's like, yeah, I get it. You like Julia Sugarbaker. Like, I get it. You want to be Julia Sugarbaker? <laughs> but I, I was always obsessed with comedy and things were light and optimistic and stuff. And I think that's the kind of stuff I want to put in the world. I just wasn't, I came to this realization and I'm sure you guys are gonna find this shocking. I'm not meant to be like doing dark, heavy, intense, heavy, horror, gore, darkness movies. People like to see me do light movies. And I was like, okay. And it's not always like, it doesn't put you in the cool kid club a lot. I don't care. I don't want to be in the cool kid club. I really don't. I want to make optimistic stuff that makes girls excited to be women in this world because it is a wonderful thing to be a woman in this world. Yes. Brilliant. So every single one of us on the stage believes that when you connect women, you can change the narrative. Jen. Can you, talk, can you talk about some of the more important connections you've made in your career and how your life experience has changed the types of stories that you want to tell? Connection is everything. Connection's the whole point. The whole thing that I love about the job that I um, got to do until May was the <laughs> connections that I was part of on those um, in that workspace. And it goes back to thinking about making summer stock theater at the Barn Theater in Augusta, Michigan, or Timberlake Playhouse in you know the middle of nowhere, Illinois, or Georgia. So like I would build the set and I would hang the lights. I know what those are. Those are Fresnels. And I would run the light switch and I'd plunge the toilets between shows and sell the tickets. And then I'd run on stage and be Fruma Sarah in Fiddler on the Roof. And that those connections have stayed with me for the rest of my life. Those are, there's just nothing better than a group of theater people. And to get to make that your actual job, you know, like when I think about missing going to work, I miss the focus pullers and the dolly grips. And there's a show that you work on that has a lot of the people working on it that I had when I worked for you on a show that I worked on. <laughs> And I love those people so much. I love those guys, and I, I, I hope they're okay, you know. Anyway, what it makes me want to tell is stories that lead to this, stories that make us feel like we want to reach out and be part of what somebody else is doing. And so sometimes that means family movies for me. I love things like Yes Day. I love things like I have a movie come, oh. <laughs> I have another one similar from we love you in family movie we love family movie anyway um that thank you <laughs> before i get knocked out of my union i'm gonna <laughs> mindy what kind of stories are you looking to tell next and what kind of connections would you like to make in the future to bring those stories to life you know i think i um am similar to these to where I think life is hard for everyone, right? And when we come home, we um, there's so many external pressures in our life, internal pressures we put on ourselves, and I want to be entertained. I don't want to watch something that feels like a homework assignment, and I don't want to watch something that is trying to make me feel bad about my choices. I want to watch something that is uplifting, that makes me laugh, um, and takes my mind off of of my work. I don't mean that to be even mindless. Like, you know, when people talk about 
rom-coms or chick flicks and these things that are considered light, it's because they star women. And that's how we've always been sort of subjugated and relegated to that. So when I make shows, um, I want to entertain. That's my primary objective. I think a lot of people uh, come to this space, they, they look at me and I'm, I'm such an other in so many categories, but I come, I come first to my, my job as an entertainer. And then if I can put people in front of the camera and behind the camera who have not traditionally been there, then that's amazing. But when I do these shows about young women and um, in, in these comedic situations, I just take what I learned from my first job that I had for many years and try to apply that and I'm like, you know, that's a show that everyone loved and still watches to this day, and wouldn't it be great if the same principles could apply to Indian women, young women, you know, women of color, and that's how I how I do it. It's like, I just want people to be able to laugh. My friend BJ Novak says it's not a Mindy Kaling show unless there's a man running shirtless in slow motion. <laughs> and you know what? I've been so used to the male gaze my entire life that yes, I will look at a handsome torso and I want to provide that for you people, right? Occasionally, occasionally, in addition to great female relationships and honest conversations that women have when they're young, you know? So that's, that's kind of what, what I'm trying to do. That's awesome. In today's world, so much of how we connect, whether it's with each other or to our fans, to be clear, they have fans, I do not have fans. Um, or, in my case, with customers, is through technology. <laughs> we connect through technology. So, Reese, you once said that by picking up a phone or calling someone, it can really clarify things. It could be a business venture. It could be a personal goal. My question to anybody who wants to take it is, can you share how the power of connection, or maybe even just one phone call, helped you make a pivot? Oh yeah, I mean, I think we all, like, we all, I pick up the phone a hundred times a day to call my best friends who are all here. Thank you. Shout out to my best friends. Um, but I, uh, I think there's something really profound about that connection that we, we lose a lot with too much texting. And, and, and I recently had something yesterday where I, I, you know, oh, I did not want to make the call. I did not want to, I did everything to avoid making this call, y'all. I took a really long shower. I did extra conditioner. I exercised like 10 minutes longer than I even wanted to because I did not want to make this call. And I picked up the phone and I, put, I just pushed the number and I did the call and the person on the other end was so appreciative that I took the time to, like it, sometimes that takes five minutes. Right. And it's an uncomfortable five minutes even with it's a friend or somebody um, that you, you have to like say something hard at work or break up with somebody. It's just dealing with it you know we, we're so avoidant now and it's like we have to just like lean into it so that power of just picking up the phone is something i really want to i know we all know it but i think it's important for the younger generation that we just encourage them i completely them. agree we yeah. got to get over this idea that it's texting and texting only and we have to get back to actual connection i agree voice to voice face to yeah yeah calling people and also be getting out of the house. There's an epidemic of loneliness right now. Um, and I think people are just craving community. So that doesn't mean like you have to have awkward interactions, but like having people at your house every week to just, I've been making chocolate at my <laughs> office. <laughs> and it's so fun to have, of course I am. Of course I'm making chocolates or crafting because that's what I do in all my free time. But um, yeah, just getting people together because... Do you know what my... I'm sorry, interrupt. No, go ahead. I, I literally have nothing else to say. <laughs> I, I love to call it one perfect hour where it's like the eight minute call where you, you say, I'm calling you, we're talking, you text someone, okay? We're talking eight minutes and we're hanging up. That's it. No matter what, we're hanging up. And it just is like, it takes the pressure off and it makes it kind of fun that you know it's going to end. But one perfect hour at night once you have kids down, which at teenagers, you stop ever having kids down, but you find it anyway. And you say, okay, I'm coming over. We are downloading for one. And if you can just do that off, like every now and then, you can hold a friendship for the rest of your life. That's right. That is an amazing pro tip. Eight minute calls and one hour sesh. One perfect hour. Love it. TM. Okay, so all three of you have such powerful, compelling, amazing voices. 
did, was there an aha moment where you discovered your voice? Were you always like this, even as a small child? <laughs> Inquiring well, Mulligan and Mindy. Like you must have been like this even when you were little Mindy. I, I, I mean, it, it, we talk about like ambition and wanting to put ourselves out there and as a grown woman, that is like a very admirable quality, but when you're, who's proven themselves, but when you're five or six years old and you're like, I wanna be a comedy writer and you're a chubby Indian kid from suburban Boston whose parents are immigrants, they're like, we don't wanna hear that. And so I think that um, I did always have this urge. I loved comedy, even though, um, you know, no one on either side of my family had been done anything creative or been you know, obviously in Hollywood or anything like that. And they were really fearful of it as they should have been and very protective of me and didn't want me to fail. And so um, despite that, I always thought that that's the career path I wanted to pursue. Even though year after year, I was constantly getting like uh, external uh, feedback of the opposite. Like, don't do this. You don't look like you should be on screen. Nobody wants to hear from you. Like, And I just had this mental defect where I was like, I keep hearing no, but I'm going to keep doing it, you know? And at a certain point, you know, um, yeah, so I I think I always had it. I didn't always have the confidence, um, but I always had the urge, and I couldn't turn it off. And so that is the, the in resiliency, right? Which is, we hear about that all the time, but resiliency is probably the most important um, aspect of my career that's kept me going when I've had hard times and failed, which is a lot. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of how I how I did it. Okay, who thinks that resiliency as a mental defect is something they want to have? That was so inspiring. Amazing. Anybody else want to jump in? Oh, like what an aha moment where I felt like okay, well you know, I, there's something about turning 40 too where everything just shifted. Suddenly I was the grown up. Like I don't know if y'all have ever had that where. You're like, oh, you get into a room and you've been in rooms all your life and all your career and you were like the youngest and you were the intern and then, then you were like a little bit older and you were the, you know, doing that and then you were like very, very good at your job and then you were making more money. But then there was some weird shift when I turned 40 that people actually wanted to hear what I had to say and that was like very t terrifying <laughs> because you're like, wait, am I ready for that? Like, am I ready? People are listening to what I have to say. Um, so, but I think all that preparation I had done about working really hard, and you can't discount where you are, like even the beginning stages of, I was an intern um, in, in my industry when I was 17 and 18 and 19, and I did every job that you could possibly do um, in my industry on the front end and the back end, so that I understand that, that we are all basically like just doing the best we can, and that no one's more important than anyone else. So that was a really great life lesson for me as I did have to step into leadership is that I understood what everybody had done and brought to the table. So I had much more patience and much more compassion for everyone involved. That is so incredible, so incredible. <laughs> the biggest, most joyful, in my opinion, change that I've noticed over the past few years is that we as women are no longer allowing someone else to tell our stories. We're owning the narrative, and we're changing the faces and the voice of the stories being told. And I'm using the royal we because it's really these three incredible women to my left. The more we connect with each other, the stronger we become, and that momentum continues to build. So I want to leave us on a super inspiring note. This is to each of you. In your opinion, why is working together, telling our own stories so important and changing the narrative, and also changing the world in that we live in. Well, we're finally reflecting back what women see all the time in each other and in themselves. Instead of just giving them some vapid idea of what it is to be the wife, the girlfriend, of the man who's out there doing everything, we're showing them themselves. Because we all know that, I'm sorry, there are a couple of men in this room Oh, rock. They're the friendlies. <laughs> they're the we friendlies. all know, and they do too if they're here, that we are the ones who make it all happen. So it's about time. I, I think that was so well put. I think that 
as I've gotten more successful and I made that difficult transition from an employee to an employer, which can be something that we don't necessarily encourage in women and it can be scary. And as I've done that and as I've as I have taken on to my shoulders, like, okay, you're not just someone who's a comedy writer, you're a mentor now. And that's scary and you can let people down. But what has been so amazing about filling my shows with directors who are women, writers who are women, you know, department heads who are women, women of color, is that everything I've done has become better. And I get an insight into things that you see, whether it's on a college campus or it's about an Indian family and things like Ganesh Puja, these specifics that are just good for business, right? People are seeing things they never got to see before, but we've all seen, and I get to be the person that puts them on the screen. And that's just feels, even though it's something that we're used to, feels innovative because we've just been starved for it for so long. So it's just been, um, it, it, it's been such an exciting time to take advantage of those things. And the things that I used to think were a liability back when I was 24, are now my most valuable assets. Yeah, that's really well said, Mindy. I like that. Yeah, because you don't know what your superpowers are. You get older, you're like, oh, that's my superpower. I just want to say, too, I, I, first of all, I want to shout out the men in the room. I want to say something. Like, the fact, like, there are men who are so deeply interested in celebrating women's lives. There are so many dads, there are so many brothers who stand behind all of us and all of our work and stand on sets and they are like, go out there, do this. We're so excited you're here. The, the women are in charge, finally. We have one of our incredible line producers here, Mary Howard, and she just runs a set like a mother, but also like a general of a five-star army. I was just thinking as we're talking, I'm thinking Mary Howard, Mary Howard. Yeah, Hi, Mary. I mean, Mary Howard could run a small country. <laughs> but it's incredible to see the way men treat her with such respect. And it's so important to have female leadership. And let me just also say that something that's very, very important that I think that, that we all talk about a lot, but it's really, really important, um, is that women's stories are good business. Okay, there's a movie that happened this summer with a, pink, a person in pink costume that I wasn't in. Okay, but that movie made over a billion dollars globally. Is that because people don't want to see it? It's because we're starving for it. There is an incredible singer named Taylor Swift who's about to have the highest grossing musical tour of all time. I hear it's like $3 billion. We are starving for our stories to be told. So not only should I just say, and none of that is possible without everybody who shows up and watches the movies and goes to the concerts and dresses in the costumes and tells their children. So you guys are part of the change that we're seeing in this world and it's so exciting. That's incredible. Okay, so I'm a marketer, and every good marketer knows you have to end with a call to action, so I'm gonna steal the one that Reese just said. Know your superpower. It doesn't have to be a secret weapon. You can let other people know your superpower, too. Prior to today, I knew the three of you were amazing. I knew you were close friends, but today showed that you are next level extraordinary. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys.